Hi, in chapter one it is an introduction to business law, legal and ethical environment of business. So we're going to do kind of a broad-based look at where do we get our laws from, what do laws mean, what is jurisprudence, um, and then I am going to walk you through a little bit more detail in a second um, YouTube video for this chapter um, that I'm adding in, which is somewhat of a history of where do we get common law from. How did it get to um, us today? What is it that we use it for? How do we use it? Um, and why was it important? So as we go through some of this material, I, I kind of want you to constantly be thinking about um, what is justice? You know, when we say that something's against the law, um, what does that really mean? What is the outcome that we want? Um, and then we need to look at the idea of fairness. You know, sometimes something that is just is not necessarily always fair or vice versa. And we'll be looking at the um, issues of how business reacts to these laws that are placed upon them and how they function within the framework of the U.S. legal system. I wanted to start with this statue of justice. Um, seen pretty frequently throughout um, history. And the idea is that a couple things I want to pull to your attention. The balancing of the scales, the blindfold, and the sword. So the sword is what we started talking about in class. That the idea in order to have a legal culture, in order to have a cohesive societal culture, we have to have laws in place. And then we have to have some type of um, enforcement of those laws. If I were to say that you know, no one in class can use their cell phone. If I don't have some type of repercussion, if you do that, then there's no purpose of having the law. And so that's what the sword is for. There has, justice has to have some way to enforce what uh, laws are out there. But it is supposed to be an ethical in system, meaning blind. Nothing besides the facts in front or, all, or what is what is supposed to matter. And here we see the, the idea of the facts, quote unquote, would be the information that we put in each one, in each side of the balance, in each bowls of the balance. So that, again, justice is not trying to weight one side or lean more heavily to one side or another. It is supposed to be a fair process, although we know in reality there are some issues with that. So what the book wants to introduce you to are all these learning objectives. And so these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, and you're able to read through these pretty slowly, so I'm not going to sit and you know, go through each one um, here. But we are going to look at the idea of what is law, jurisprudence. We've already touched on what is law in the classroom. So we have a few more things that we're going to be introduced to in this that you are have been hopefully already if you've read you should have read the chapter and so you've already been introduced to some of these ideas um, law unfortunately there's no one definition because different cultures can change the definition slightly they can alter it a little bit sometimes it is a question of a form of law um, even in the US when you say what is law we have different ways of getting laws we have different types of laws we have different enforcement of the laws so it's not easy to just say this is law but we have to go forward with something and so the book uses this idea of it's a set of rules that are enforced by government authority the idea being that we have our government which creates the laws they're then enforced by the president um, and then that trickles down into the different police forces, FBI's, etc. So law is, for our purposes at this point, a set of rules that are enforced by a government authority. Who enforces? It depends on where we are. Um, from the federal government, you can have agencies such as FBI, IRS, Defense, Education, um, Health Departments, Justice Departments, etc. Um, through the legislative branch, there are specific places. We have the Postal Inspector, which is federal, goes out through the U.S., but that is controlled directly by Congress, um, as is the Capitol Police. Um, the judicial branch does have a group um, of enforcement officials within certain court systems, especially in the past, um, I would say, even about um, 25, 30 years, as it's been more and more dangerous. We, uh, We've seen installation of 
you know, if you go to a courthouse, you're going to go through a metal detector, you're going to have your bag searched, etc. Um, and so there's different um, people who enforce the laws through different branches of government, but most of it comes out of the executive branch. We have other federal agencies that are given power to enforce some of their laws, such as NASA, um, the FDIC, Social Security, etc. And then the same thing kind of repeats at the state level. Things that the state, laws that the state puts out, we have the governor's office that can enforce it, that goes through the police, um, state agencies, etc. We have the local, again, another kind of way of the same thing. We have the local city council that passes laws, and it's the mayor that enforces those through the city police. Um, jurisprudence is the idea of the study of law, really looking at the philosophy of law. And so as far back as we've had laws, as, we, as far back as we've had groups coming together and performing a societal core, we've had people who studied how those laws come about. Even back to ancient Greece, we've always had this kind of study of the philosophical side of it. And your book introduces you to a couple of different um, theories or schools of thought. And I just want to walk you through a couple of these to explain you know, why it's important to think about how we think about laws. Because um, depending on schools of thought, you have some lawyers, you have some police officers, you have different people who have different views of not only what the law is, but how the law should be applied. The, positives, um, the positivist school states that law is the supreme will of the state, and it only applies to citizens of that nation of that time. So that means that we would, if we were to look at this from our point of view, then um, the United States would pass laws that are current, that meet our definition of what we consider ethical behavior, legal behavior, um, and it only applies at this time frame. And then as soon as the country moves to a different point of view, you would see a shift in some of the laws because of that. Also, laws for the U.S. don't apply to Canada. They don't apply to you know, Mexico, because it's only to the nation that has created them. Um, the idea behind this is that laws are not universal. Just because we think something is um, illegal, other countries can have different viewpoints, other cultures can have different viewpoints. So the positive school is really kind of taking a snapshot of a society at a particular time and saying this is what the law is and the law should be for this group of people at this time frame. A criticism of this is that it's often hard to remain true to your conscience because you're, depending on how society is evolving, then it's going your 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 moral compass is often going to be different than what the state is. So, an example I bring into this is slavery. If we think back to 1856, we take a snapshot then the laws of the United States at that time were pretty clear that um, slaves were property. They belonged to people. They, could, they were goods to be bought and sold. And so we had a split in this country. You see the slave states, the southern states, the free states, the northern states. And then we had Dred Scott, an escaped slave. There was a legal decision on whether he had to be put back in or not. But this was a much bigger idea because whatever the Supreme Court decided in the Dred Scott case, we had new territories opening up, and this was going to impact these new territories. And so every step of the way that we're looking at this, for the positivist school, um, this is where we see the conflict come in because at this time frame we had people who um, believed slavery was fine. We had, obviously in the South we had people in the North who felt slavery was not fine and I think that's a little bit of a gross misnomer in that I'm sure there were Southern people who f were against slavery and Northern people who were for but in the bigger picture we had this divide. But they're all Americans and we have um, American laws that apply to this entire map in front of us. And so you basically, if we say that slavery is legal, then all the people in the green areas, their moral compass is a little bit off from what the legality of this legislation is. So they, their conscious doesn't, what they feel is right and wrong, doesn't match up with what the law states. Um, and then once we get past 
um, the Emancipation Proclamation and we get um, slavery is outlawed, then you see the same shift in the South. Suddenly their view of right and wrong is no longer matching up with what the legal issue is. Um, and so this creates the problem that a lot of people criticize the positive school if we just say that we're going to look at this one decision at this one time frame in this snapshot and we're going to look at what the laws are and if it's illegal it's legal if it's not it's not and if it's illegal it's good and if it's illegal it's bad but we see that that's open to interpretation next we're going to go into legal realism 